Because this event is broadcasting live, you can join in the conversation. Tweet us at UKCSRA and use the hashtag CSRATalks. We'll also be tweeting a number of questions as well. When we hashtag Q followed by a number, send us back your answers with hashtag A followed by the number of the question. There are around 400,000 people working in the civil service today, and we estimate about 20,000 of them are lesbian, gay, bisexual, or have a minority sexual orientation. Of those 20,000 people, around 4,400, or 22%, are bisexual. Roughly 50% of them are women, and roughly 50% of them identify as men. Overall, they feel less satisfied at work. They feel less well resourced to do their jobs, and compared to their heterosexual colleagues, they feel more pressurised at work. 42% of bisexual civil servants feel their performance has been unfairly evaluated by their managers. 58% feel that there are no opportunities for learning and development or to progress in their own careers within their organisations. And 21.5% of bisexual civil servants say they've experienced bullying, harassment or discrimination in the workplace. And compared to their lesbian or gay counterparts, bisexual people are half as likely to be out at work. That adds up to an environment where bisexual people in the civil service feel almost completely invisible, and that's why we've decided to focus the first of our new guest speaker series events, CISRA Talks, on bisexuality. We want to know what it's really like to be a bisexual person working in the civil service today. That's why we've invited a range of civil servants from across government to talk about their experiences of being out and bisexual at work. I'm Emily Miles, I'm the Group Director of Strategy in DEFRA. So I'm a bisexual woman, um, but I only really acknowledged to myself that I was a bisexual woman about 10 years ago, so long after I joined the civil service. I joined the civil service in the year 2000, before that I had done a um, first degree in English at Cambridge, a master's degree in international law of armed conflict at Nottingham. Really wanted to be a diplomat, missed the deadline for the diplomatic fast stream, so became a European fast stream and joined the Home Office. And then I got completely sucked into immigration, identity cards, asylum, policing, criminal justice, policy issues. I spent about three years in Downing Street as a home affairs advisor to Tony Blair. And then <clears throat> in between having a couple of kids, um, worked in the Prime Minister's Strategy Unit, went back to the Home Office and ran a case working function to clear the UK's historic asylum backlog. Um, and then became, ultimately became the Director of Policing in the Home Office. And then from there I went to the Cabinet Office in 2014 to run a review into illegal working. I uh, did various bits of strategic policy um, in the run up to the general election in 2015. And I came to DEFRA last November to be their Director of Strategy. Early on in my civil service career I worked in Downing Street and I had to get developed vetted. And I spent three hours in a basement in somewhere near the Foreign Office being interviewed by a retired police officer who towards the end of going through all my bank statements and what have you asked me and do you have any lesbian or other deviant tendencies to which as a whatever I was 25 26 year old didn't quite dare say anything but said well no um, and then later when I acknowledged myself that I was bisexual started getting quite worried that if I ever had to go through that kind of vetting experience again I wouldn't get vetted and that was all fine for a bit, for a few years, um, but eventually, in about 2011, I'd been away on a career break for a year, um, and my security vetting had run out. <clears throat> Not developed vetting, just security clearance. And so I needed to fill out a form to renew it, and at the end of the form it said, is there anything else we should know? And if you don't tell us it, then this might, almost this might be held against you. So I had quite a long night of the soul where I thought, do I tell them, don't I? And decided that I would. 
and then spent the next month thinking I was going to lose my job because I was bisexual and that wasn't going to be appropriate. I thought that there would be some kind of, um, I don't know, permanent sexual in the sky that would come and tell me that um, I was a bit too loose as a woman and I well, didn't belong in the civil service. As it was, it turned out fine, I got my vetting. Um, but I still kept it quite a secret at work. Um, and it was only a few months ago that, that I was sitting in a discussion of the executive committee in DEFRA, because I sit on the executive committee. We're talking about diversity declaration rates and how people weren't filling it in and weren't prepared to declare what their sexuality was in particular, but also their disability and so on. <clears throat> and I realized that if I had thought when I was 25 or 26 that I wasn't the only p bisexual person in the civil service, or if I thought in 2011 when I was filling out that form that I wasn't the only bisexual person in the senior civil service, that I wouldn't have felt so afraid. So I thought, I'm gonna to have to tell my story, otherwise no one else is gonna declare their sexuality. So I wrote a blog for DEFRA about it and how I had been really afraid. And now I was encouraging other people to fill out the, the bit of the employment form that had all the declaration bits on. Just so that for someone like me, I, I remember looking at some statistics when I was working in the home office and thinking, well, if that's true, if there's only that percentage of bisexual people in the senior civil service, I think that might just be me and I might be the only one because I suspect no one else was saying anything. So there's definitely been a couple of jobs that I've, I've been asked to apply for that I haven't gone for um, because I just didn't want to go through the develop vetting experience again. Um, and again, what was great about writing this blog earlier in the year was that I got in touch with the vetting policy people in um, the cabinet office just to run my blog past them and see if they had anything to say about it now. They were absolutely horrified that anyone who was bisexual might be put off from applying for developed vetting and we're very, very keen to get the message out that um, the civil service is an inclusive place. This is not something that was going to be counted against you in your vetting process, which again was quite a healing experience for me. So, I mean, I was very, very scared about being out there, about being bisexual, because I thought I would get very heavily judged. So you, you could say that had a load of stress that went with it, but it, it frankly was completely self-imposed. Once I actually came out, the response was astonishingly supportive. Um, I had all sorts of people emailing me privately. The permanent secretary of DEFRA then went on to write a blog about how her daughter was turning into a son and talking about being the parent of a transgender child, which she said she wouldn't have done if she hadn't have read the blog that I'd written. So it's it's been one of the most satisfying things I've done um, in terms of feeling like I'm helping other people feel empowered. I mean, I suppose my general approach is it's it feels like the trouble is it feels like quite a private thing and you end up having to wear it at work just to have people feel safe. I don't know that it probably is that different to how it was 15 or 16 years ago because in my experience people are normally pretty cool and quite respectful. Um, I think the biggest difference though has been that people started to get married and that just wasn't happening when I was um, first in the civil service so being able to celebrate a colleague's civil partnership or marriage I suppose the other big difference is that people are starting to have kids very openly, so um, gay couples are parents as well and that just wasn't really the case as much 15, 16 years ago. I think, certainly in my situation, I think I didn't feel at all supported or like there was a place to go. I don't think I really knew whether that there was support that I could seek or that I didn't need to feel quite so on my own or that it was a normal experience to go through. I thought I was the only person going through this. And I definitely thought that there would be jobs, particularly at very senior levels, um, that I would be completely cut off from because I wouldn't be able to get this vetting. So I think, I suppose what I would like is a lot more information about the vetting process, um, a lot more reassurance and a sense that the people doing the interviewing are actually quite skilled and, and um, uh, not they don't say stupid things like deviant tendencies when they talk about lesbianism. Um, I am again reassured by the vetting policy people that's not the case anymore but just giving some of those messages to people going through the vetting process because it is quite intrusive when you're doing that high level of vetting, the developed vetting, I think that would be really good. Hi, I'm Hannah Dormer. I work in 
the HR team for Universal Credit in DWP. Um, I'm also the co-chair of DW Pride, which is the national LGBT network. So after I left university, I went to uh, law school because I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. So I did a law conversion course and um, decided that wasn't quite the right thing for me. Um, but employment law was really interesting and a lot of the stuff I was really interested outside of that was diversity and inclusion kinds of things. Um, so I thought maybe HR would be a good route to go down. Um, I did a bit of temping for about a year and then I joined the civil service in October last year. I am out at work, I've been out at work from pretty much day one. I did find it easier to come out um, at this job because I have a girlfriend and it's easy to just drop that you're seeing your girlfriend into conversation, um, whereas sometimes before I've, I like to come out as soon as possible because um, I think I'm a bit of a fan of the, uh, the, um, the plaster, pulling the plaster off approach. Um, because if you say it early, then you know what people's views are going to be. You know who the people to avoid are, and you know how it's going to be received and how you're going to be treated from there on out. If you don't come out soon, you kind of sit there worrying about it um, and wondering how to bring it up, how to test the waters. So I came out as soon as possible just to make sure that I knew where I stood. I chose to come out um, in that way because it's, it's easier and I guess, <laughs> Having said that, uh, I don't really go with the testing the water approach. I suppose I was testing the water um, because if that had been more difficult than it was, I think I would have not come out later as bisexual. Um, as it was, putting that out there kind of let people know that I had an interest in the LGBT community and I was able to say about my interest in diversity and inclusion more broadly. Um, and from that point it was easier to drop into conversation um, a few weeks down the line that I was bisexual. I think it's easier for me to be out in the workplace um, working in HR um, than it would be in other parts of the department. I think it being such a large department, it being a service delivery department, um, that that experience is going to be really, really different in in all different places. I think it's going to be much easier in the corporate centre than out in the operational um, areas um, and obviously a lot easier in HR because this is the kind of stuff that we talk, well, this is somewhere in the region of a lot of the stuff we talk about day in, day out, particularly if we're doing work on diversity and inclusion. Um, I work in a business partner team, so we do work across the board. Um, that it does include diversity and inclusion um, stuff, so there are people there who who kind of are at least aware that there are people who are different from themselves. I think that makes it a lot easier. I think it's absolutely crucial for DWP to have a really diverse workforce, um, particularly because it is a service delivery um, department. If you've got people on the front lines who are having to deal with people's personal lives because it's to do with benefits, you have to talk about your personal circumstances and they don't have an awareness of the difficulties for people who are you know, LGBT, particularly trans people, um, you know, for BAME people, for disabled people, if they don't have that understanding, a lot of which is going to come from personal lived experience, then they're not going to be able to provide the kind of service that they need to provide, and not just for frontline staff, but, but for the policy makers and the people who are designing those processes and making sure that everything happens at the, in the back end. If they don't have those kinds of insights, then they're not going to design things in the way that they need to be designed in order to properly deliver that service to the full range of customers and claimants. So I think one thing that the civil service could do to support bisexual staff is to just make sure there's more awareness of the fact that bisexual people exist and that um, we do have slightly different issues to other members of the, well particularly the lesbian and gay community um, and to just not make assumptions. Uh, it's difficult, I guess, for the, the organisation itself to do that, but I think on an individual basis, um, we can all do that all the time. Make fewer assumptions. So welcome to the Q&A session of the CISRA Talks bisexuality session today. Uh, we have three willing guests here to talk to us um, about how they experience 
being bisexual civil servants. So I will pass you over to them to introduce themselves. Well, hi, I'm Carl Lutter. I'm from uh, the Department for Work and Pensions. I'm a performance analyst for the East London District. Uh, and uh, I'm involved in various DNI functions within the organisation, one of which being the Chair for Liaison, which is the LGBT Staff Network for London. I'm Mary Peart. I'm based in DEFRA in the Diversity and Inclusion team, and I'm also volunteering in the BI team for the Civil Service Rainbow Alliance. Hi, I'm Hannah. I work in the Department of Work and Pensions um, in HR for Universal Credit. Um, and I'm the co-chair of DW Pride, which is the national LGBT network. So all of you identify as bisexual. Um, one of the things that we know impacts people quite a lot is by invisibility. Could you explain for viewers that haven't come across that term before what it is and how it impacts on you and people that you know? Um, so I think that's a really good question. I think that invisibility is one of the biggest issues that faces bisexual people um, I think it affects me definitely you know in my personal life and at work for instance if you're walking down the street holding hands with your partner for instance I have a boyfriend who I've been with for three years people will immediately assume that we are a straight couple um, so that's sort of just one example of invisibility there and in that people will assume that, that I'm straight um, in the workplace I think that the same thing happens if I refer to my boyfriend a certain certain assumptions are made um, so there's sort of not really the same opportunity there to come out as one thing, to come out as gay or to be assumed to be straight. You're sort of caught in this sort of limbo in between um, where in often in the LGBT community you are also assumed to be gay and in the straight world um, you might be assumed to be straight. So I think that's how I see by invisibility. It limits the depth of relationships you share with your colleagues. Uh, considering the amount of time that you spend with people at work, um, it becomes very, you know, they, but they become a second family. In fact, you, you probably see colleagues at work more than you see your own family. Um, and in that you're unable to share uh, with them aspects of your life that they would readily share um, just in passing conversation or how they approach life or what is meaningful to them or how they spend their time uh, means that you, you, you feel devalued and that you're not part of that, uh, uh, that, that unit and you feel like a constant outsider within that environment. So how does it make you feel when you're constantly having those conversations over and over again? I know for me because I'm in a same-sex relationship, when I come out at work, everyone's just like, oh, right, that's fine. And it probably helps that my partner works in the same part of the civil service, so everyone knows both of us. But for you guys, it's probably a bit more kind of, you have to do it more frequently. How does that impact on you? I think for me, sometimes it just it just stops me doing it. Um, after a while, after having, after having to say it again and again and again, um, I think sometimes I just end up calling myself gay. Um, I'm currently in a relationship with a woman, so that's the easier way to do it. Um, or queer, or just some kind of word that is non-committal and not having to keep reminding people that I'm bisexual um, because that can feel quite like a strong word to use. And I know that's a really weird way of thinking about it, but there's a lot of stigma and connotations and it just, having to do it again and again probably does stop me doing it sometimes. You referred to a stigma around bisexuality, and how does how does that manifest? Um, so part of it, I think, is in the word itself. Um, for you know, gay people and lesbian and straight people, you've got gay, lesbian, straight. They don't use the word sexual, um, whereas bisexual. I mean, you can say bi, but people infer that anyway. But there's also the sort of association that um, being bisexual is all about sex. Um, it's really over-sexualised and that's, that's just not what it's about at all in any more than anyone else's sexuality is. Um, so I think it's a mixture of those two things, the word itself and um, the stigma and the associations that people have with the word. I think back to your question about how does it feel for me to constantly remind people that I'm bi rather than straight or gay, I think I also agree with um, the feeling that you just don't bother anymore that um I definitely don't remind people of that because it it's you want to avoid that stigma and you don't want to be having that conversation with your line manager or with your colleagues every day um and for me I think that affects me at work in that it affects my relationships at work um 
that I'm not bringing my whole self to work, that my colleagues aren't knowing me completely and what's important to me and what my values are. Um, Because whilst being bi, for some people it wouldn't affect your values or your political views, you know, it could be a separate thing, but for me it's definitely an important part of who I am. Um, So I think it affects me bringing bringing my whole self to work and being myself at work. Um, So one thing that I actually also wanted to say about the stigma is that for a while that stigma around bisexuality um, and the word bisexual did actually stop me using the word bisexual and I would refer to myself as someone who liked women or queer or something and recently I've become much more sort of protective of the word bisexual because it is what I am and I don't want to have to skirt around that word so I think I probably come out more, way more than necessary to everyone and anyone now just to reinforce that, to try and reduce some of that stigma, at least in the people around me. To own the word. To, yeah, to own the word, absolutely. Okay, so talking about that impact that it has on you as individuals, how could the civil service better support you, either within your own departments or you know, looking at joining up across departments in the whole civil service? I think personally by raising awareness. If we're communicating what it means to what bisexuality means and what it means to be bisexual and communicating the experiences of bisexual people, uh, I think we can raise the awareness that bisexual people are no different to anyone else, that we, we, we involve ourselves in long-term meaningful relationships like anyone else. We, we, we care about the same things, we want the same things. Uh, and, and, and we strive for that same level of equality and acceptance that everyone seems to take for granted. I think also we would really value other people's views that, um, for instance, myself, I'm only one individual. I only have one experience of being bi and of being a bi woman in the civil service. Um, so the more and more feedback and experiences that we can learn um, from others would be really valuable. And I think what's also important is you need to realise that things change as well. Um, I, I had a very sort of uh, closed view of how I identified what I, what I felt I was interested in, what I what I was, uh, and the more I've been involved in in, in in furthering LGBT equality, the more I've learnt about things, the more I've identified in myself, which changes a lot of the labels that we ascribe ourselves when we're first setting out on a journey to discovering our identities. So I do think that it can become more complex at a later stage or it could simplify but I think that to a large extent the process of coming out is a very fluid experience and I think it's a journey that everyone will spend time on until they're at a stage where they're feeling entirely comfortable with with how they approach life how they fit into life and how they identify on a personal level. I would agree with that I think society expects us to label ourselves much too much and labels can be very problematic because it's very easy to put a label on and then that label just sticks forever and you know we we do evolve over our lifetimes we're not always going to be the same person that we were on the day that we were born so I think that's a really good point. Um, I I would agree with that but I would also say that um, I think labels can be really helpful um, in two kind of ways one in terms of trying to work out who you are sort of in the beginnings of particularly when you are really unsure about what's going on and you're sort of possibly in denial or just trying to work out who you are you know particularly as as a teenager or a young adult it's quite difficult to know who you are if there's not a word for it Um, I think that's quite important but there's also sort of political weight to words um, and I think that's that's another reason that I, I really strongly identify with the word bisexual because there is a community and there is um, you know a, a political force there are activists um, who are out there trying to destigmatize bisexuality and um, kind of get the word out about it I don't know if that's the right phrase but um, so I mean I think I would completely agree with that there I think the problem for me is that when we get too hung up on words that's when it becomes an issue so the words are great as a signpost but I think when we start to use them as a map that we have to follow all the time that's when it becomes problematic. If anyone wants to find out more about what CSRA is doing on by issues you can go to our website which is ukcsra.com. We work to make the civil service better for LGBT people. Last year we published our blueprint for making the civil service better for LGBT people. 
You can read the plan in detail at ukcsra.com. Here are some of the things that we said. The civil service needs better data on the experiences of bisexual staff. CISRA is working to improve the quality of the questions on sexual orientation in the Civil Service People Survey, encouraging people to complete the People Survey, and lobbying for centrally collated demographic data to be broken down by sexual orientation, such as performance management and talent scheme applications. We're also working to improve declaration rates across departments. Our view is that it should be mandatory for all departments to monitor sexual orientation internally, at least annually, and the results should be published. We're working with the Civil Service Diversity Champion, Sue Owen, to ensure monitoring of sexual orientation is included in Permanent Secretary objectives. We also said that the Civil Service needs more bisexual role models. Bisexual women and men are likely to feel invisible in the workplace, and to not feel confident being open about their sexual orientation. We've encouraged bisexual people to act as role models and promoted the work of these role models across government. We created the first civil service-wide role model guide and you can download it now from our website, ukcsra.com. Finally, we also said the civil service needs to provide better support for bisexual staff. Bisexual women and men are likely to suffer significantly lower levels of well-being, with 60% of bisexual employees reporting that they are suffering from anxiety. They're also most likely to experience discrimination, bullying or harassment in the workplace. CISRA is working to separate out biphobia from homophobia and transphobia in relevant civil service policy, providing direct support to bisexual women and men in the civil service who encounter bullying and harassment on the basis of their sexual orientation, and we're piloting a new peer support network, CISRA Buddies, to provide career support to LGBT staff, including bisexual people. And that's just some of what we're doing. And you can help too. So why get involved? I just wanted to be a good role model. I wanted to get involved in something slightly bigger. I felt that there was more that I could give to the wider civil service. It's a really good way to get involved in the wider picture. Everything I find that CISRA do is just, there's an energy and an excitement about it. We do things that matter to LGB civil servants. The most important part is really making an impression and really putting at the forefront LGBT rights within the civil service. We help to give a voice to lots of civil servants who might be in different parts of the UK, isolated and unsupported. For me it is about um, pe people being able to feel in work the same and use the same skills and be the same person as they are outside of work making the civil service a great place to work in general. CISRA has the ability to join all this together. We are more than the sum of the parts. Give us a little of your time and you'll get so much more back. You'll meet a wide range of colleagues who actually can be extremely useful contacts for your career. Lots of extra competencies, lots of extra skills. That feeling of community and strength and positivity I've got more confidence in engaging with people who are much more senior than me. I think probably it's the friendships I've made and the solidarity. I think it's fun. There's lots of variety, there's lots of opportunities for you to learn to do new and exciting things. It's great fun. It's a very enriching experience. Everything at work is more collaborative and better if you get involved. We're making the civil service more inclusive, more diverse, more open and more equal. Better. If I can make it better for a single person, that's a fantastic thing. So join us. Become a volunteer at ukcsra.com forward slash volunteer. Thanks for joining us for what's been the first of our new guest speaker series, CISRA Talks Bisexuality. Our next CISRA Talks event is CISRA Talks Trans, it's happening on the 3rd of November and details will be posted on our website soon. For all our upcoming events, you can see them on our website, ukcsra.com forward slash events.